Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Thomas. Today we're back here with the Green Scorpion. Yeah, I'm back. Peter's all fixed up, ready to go. Today we got the top 20 Legend of Zelda boss battles. So, this is gonna be interesting to say the least. So, don't have a lot of experience with Zelda, so I'm actually kinda curious to see where it's gonna go. So, let's see what you got, Green Scorpion. Let's see what your favorite Zelda boss is. Be sure to like, subscribe for more. Hope you enjoy. Let's check it out. <laughs> here we go. Sorry, I just moved my mic. Three, two, one. <laughs> Prepare to engage. Here we go. Greetings and salutations, brave heroes of Hyrule. The hello, Green hello. Scorpion here, and I've been the Green Scorpion for 12 stinking years. <laughs> I kind of find it hard to believe, even with all the remastered countdowns I've been doing lately. No so kidding. This period of past <laughs> reflection has brought me back to a project that, dare I say, was the true ignition to my channel's launch to fame. Not oh. long after my very first countdown, I got to work on a list about my favorite series, The Legend of Zelda picking out my favorite boss from each game. It was rough around the edges, to say the least. Yeah, it was sick another episode. I expect. Because that's just what you did on YouTube back then. Damn. However, it was this... Hmm. Oh. <laughs> sophomoric effort that first caught people's attention hmm. and got my Why subscriber count into the thousands. Also, yeah, it was only about 25 minutes combined. I kind of missed when I was that brief. Eh, I plan to remake this list you. for some time now, but I didn't include it in my original remaster plans because I wanted to wait for the right time. Now, with Tears of the Kingdom settled in everyone's mind, I think yep. I'm finally ready for my return to Ganon's Tower. <laughs> the rules are simple. First of all, one boss from each mainline Zelda game. No mm -hmm. Musou side projects, Tingle spin-offs, crossbow sims, or CDI abominations. Fair Second, enough. Second, no count. final bosses, because those so ideally games open, should no be the best final bosses. never get. Maybe I'll find an opportunity to rank those sometime. And third, Aren't they the bosses Ganon? will be ranked based on I well, said mostly, whatever I want. Not all of them. Let's not overthink this here. <laughs> this is my opinion, and while I'll try to be somewhat objective and imagine what plays best for everyone, my best yardstick here is who I'm actually excited to fight on repeat playthroughs. And this can mean clever use of items or fair tests of skill, <laughs> cool designs, thrilling music, and or occasionally <laughs> plot context. Though that's not super common for dungeon bosses. This Fair does enough. mean that some of my choices from each game haven't changed since the last list, but you might be surprised by how some of them have. And I've gotten better at articulating why over the last decade. Plus, we have five more Zelda titles with plenty more bosses just waiting to be ranked. So raise your shield and sword and keep a fairy in a bottle handy, because this is my top 20 best Legend of Zelda bosses. And why don't we begin? <laughs> Love Link's just little jump around like, you. <laughs> Like a Looney Tune character over there. <laughs> That's the art style, though. Oh, here we go. First Even up. amongst the returning bosses, oh, Link's what changed most Hello. about my original list is the order. And after much deliberation, I've concluded that Link's Awakening has the all-around least interesting boss roster. They're unique in a cartoony kind of way, and I like how they all taunt you over the mystery of the island. But the mechanics of their fights leave a lot to be desired. Not awful, mind you, just middling. The HD say, remake could be worse. some, slightly worsened others, Oof. but my favorite still remains... Whoa! Eel! Eels again. I imagine serpentine bosses are hard to do in older games like this. Most pixelated games at Fair. the time would have turned them into a line of balls and call it a day. Mm -hmm. But Slime Eel is cleverly wrapped around the arena, his tail Yikes. flailing out of a hole in the floor and his head biting at you from different points on the wall. This fight requires three of Link's tools. The hook shot to pull the eel out of the wall by Come his here, face, the sword to swipe at his then exposed heart, <laughs> and the rock's feather to jump his tail Whoa. as it steadily sweeps clockwise. Well, you're supposed to need that, but the problem is that the flail tail doesn't even reach the corners of the room, so you can easily just camp out and wait for the face reveal. What is neat, though, is that the further you are from the wall, is there like a cycle space, to that pop the out? The eel will be pulled out, and the longer it'll take to recover. That's actually a nice touch. 
kind of helps sell the illusion Just that this guy's actually surrounding the playing field. The eels even got his friends who will act as decoys. Ow. You think you got the boss, but nope. Oh, look out. It's just a minor annoyance, though. The remake even colors the decoy's eyes differently, so you can go for a no decoy run if you're feeling fancy. So, mm, yeah, too strong a somewhat say. clever, hey, come here, exploitable boy. boss fight. Not too much here, but not too drawn out either. Just long enough to appreciate the idea. Fair. As much as you can appreciate Nintendo's constant obsession with eels. When an eel lunges out... Unagi. Oop! Run away! Get amore. Get it? Amore eel? <laughs> Not cool. Hey, funny. Fuck you. Yeah, I'd probably be too. <laughs> I find Zelda bosses Especially with those eels in R64. It's a puzzle Yeesh. where you have to figure out how to damage them, usually hmm. with your most recently acquired item. Fair. Or it's execution based, where the challenge lies in dodging So, strategy game versus Dark Souls. Some Got bosses it. can do both, but they usually lean in one direction or the other, and the older titles heavily leaned on execution. I personally appreciated these straightforward challenges, especially in okay. games like the original Legend of Zelda, where, sure, you had items, but they weren't necessarily... Needed? Necessary. Not Fair. most of the time, anyway. In my original countdown, I listed Manhandler. Sure, oh. you could one-shot it with a well-placed oh, bomb, and that's part of the fun, but it's not the most fun thing to look at back in 8-bit. Yeah, you can barely make out of it. There's oh. the first boss, Aquamentis, letting oh, us achieve hey, our dragon-slaying dreams, ah. if perhaps a bit too easily. Marrying these two qualities, we have Gliok, a multi-headed Hydra who likes to park himself in front of the dungeon treasure room. Like many bosses in this game, you'll fight multiple Gliok's over the course of the game, each adding a head for Jeez. a maximum of four. And this can huh, be a bit more of a than Kajora. Not even Link's magical shield can block these projectiles, oh, and when you destroy a head, it will sever and float about the room, continuing to hawk flaming mm -hmm. loogies at you. This forces the decision on whether it's better to destroy the severed heads for good, or just get through the ones in the body. Your best bet is a sword beam, but that only works if you're at full health, so the moment you get nicked, things start to get a lot harder. Yeah, one hit. Then you can well, either pay the price in arrows, front. try to get lucky with bombs, or just get up in there and perform some good old-fashioned Hylian dentistry. I'd Leon's probably go with the latter. so good that Ooh. Cadence of Hyrule remixed this boss using an identical attack pattern, just setting it all to rhythmic music, and changing its name to... Gliakenspiel. Ugh. I think I took three hearts of damage from that name alone. Yeah, and seeing not the best name. The spotlight and I agree. The most recent Zelda title, mm. It's nice to see that it's been tearing Bottom. up screens since 1986. <laughs> Get it? There's also a Gliok boss in Oracle of Seasons that goes down about the same, except after you destroy yeah. that last head, in a sudden twist, its headless body starts blindly charging. You. Oh, Jesus. That Look was out. a genuine jump scare for me the first time around. But that also does highlight why the original Gliok is only ranked number 19. It's not even the best Fair. version kind of, of straightforward, yeah. And not to spoil anything, but the better versions of this fight aren't even the best fights in their own games. Damn. Hard to ignore the stiffness of the original Zelda, but if you can learn to enjoy that old linear movement and simple stabbing attack, this is one of the most and satisfying the beats in the original LOZ. And you don't even have to get up on its back. Get up on the bed. Thank you, Phil. Not wrong game, though. <laughs> 18, coming up. I admittedly have huh. a soft spot the for Link. 2, cool. The Adventure of Link. It's not exactly what I would call good, not from a modern standpoint anyway, but nah. it's got that unyielding NES difficulty that I sometimes miss when I'm beating Dark Beast Ganon for the tenth time and forget what it is to feel. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it. But seriously, for a game made in the 80s, the sword fighting still you. holds up. Yeah, I, I might have listed Karak on here if he wasn't just an iron knuckle hastily promoted to boss status. In my hottest take from my last countdown, though, I picked Thunderbird from the Great Palace. Really? I don't know what I was thinking there. Hmm, to each own. And I don't know what I'm thinking here either, because lightning just struck twice. Yeah, I know. Again, the Thunderbird? Thunderbird is extremely frustrating. <laughs> and it's not just its attack pattern. It's the Great Palace itself. You just made it through some <gasps> of the most grueling rooms of your 8-bit career, littered with traps and dead ends and knife-chucking bird knights. And the Rude. Zelda enthusiast in me really wants these guys to be Rito, but no, mm -mm. they're apparently called Fokka. Fokka. <laughs> so yeah, after dealing with these motherfuckers, motherfuckers. <laughs> along with the rest <laughs> nice. of the palace, the last thing you want to see is this slab of red spewing uh -oh. bullets like a hyperbolically out-of-order gumball machine. I highly suggest playing Zelda 2 with a guide open. Not only will it yeah, navigate like you past all it. the useless turns in the palace, it's probably the only way you'll know this thing is invulnerable until you cast the Thunder Spell. You'd think Jeez. something called a Thunderbird would be immune to thunder. It's like calling an ice cube fire square. 
The other problem wrong. is how the Thunderbird Jeez. drains your resources. It's kind of dumb. Normally, you try to fight a boss with a full magic bar in this game so that you can pop a couple of life spells when you take hits, effectively lengthening Let me your guess, no. health bar. But the Thunder spell costs a lot of magic. And then you gotta hit this little gem on the bird's head, so you'll probably want to hmm. cast Jump to give Link those mad hops, and maybe Shield Fair. to survive the onslaught of Toho projectiles. Oh, that doesn't leave you with any mana for healing. So you really only get Shank. one shot at this, and if you run out of lives, because this game has lives, you'll have to do the whole palace all over again. Not to mention that this is Sheesh. the one room before the final boss, Dark Link. And while that's also a great fight, you'll probably be so depleted from Thunderbird and afraid to have to redo all this that you'll resort to the old crouch and stab exploit. But despite yeah, all I probably that, would too. despite all of that, yeah, I really like this fight. No joke, this is a downright Herculean task. One of the single toughest things in this whole franchise. Yeah, it's SNES. But I love it's doing fact. it. Leaping through the hail of fire not, like I'm threading oh, a needle to land those perfect sorry. sword swipes, not super and then hoping sorry. I can land myself safely Oopsie. before doing it again. It's exhilarating. I don't really expect any of you to agree with me, and that's why it's only number 18. You don't have to yeah. get on my level. But if you plan to play and enjoy Zelda 2, you're gonna you might have to. Those are the kinds of people that this boss was made for. I can imagine with all those fireballs. Yikes. Why didn't I play them? I probably lose my hair. Manhandler's out for revenge. And mm -hmm. after being clipped from its spot as the best original Zelda boss, I can <laughs> hardly blame it. But at least I can say it's still the best boss in Four Swords. Ooh. Okay, maybe not the highest honor, but what are you gonna do? Eh, true. Four Swords Could is a worse. game with a management problem. Two mediocre bosses, one good boss, and one final boss. But it is good. And arguably, it's the part of the game that best achieves what Four Swords sets out to do. Create a fun and frantic co-op Zelda experience. Manhandler in the original Zelda was a fairly open-ended boss with four weak points that you'd have to hit one way or the other, be it sneaking Better out just your sword or dropping a big old weak killing bomb. Apple. Big Manhandler is like Ooh. Manhandler, but bigger. but bigger. No shit, Sherlock. And with multiple weak points in the form of these gnashing piranha plants, which it takes look like something from to hit them pet shop all. horse. It's elementary, really, which is probably the way to go for what will be most teams' first boss that they face together. The vines revolve in an easy-to-see pattern, there's an occasional ranged seed attack, True. and when you see the petals of your color, oh, like that's that. your cue. Get in there, champ, whack some seed weeds, green? earn your garden patch. <laughs> and you also have a second phase where two links will have to grab the sides to pull the big chestnut apart. As rudimentary as it seems, it's just complex <laughs> enough to make all the players coordinate. If Blue Link decides they don't want to attack the blue flowers, it's just not going to work. Great mm -hmm. litmus test to see if these are the friends you want to play the rest of the game with. Big man handle a feel Yeah, like I can imagine like the uh fun for not of like be. friendships broken. I promise that wouldn't be fully met until future oh, geez, look out. Yeah, I can imagine the people just being like, "Yo, do it, attack the flower." And they just like, "Nope." <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, if you got a bad friend who likes to troll, let's send him this game. They're just <laughs> There is four sorts of adventure which same deal cuz yikes. That's all I can say. Good luck. You're going to need it. All right, three down. Next up, 16. I won't pause too much since, you know, long video. Next to Four Swords, some of the most obscure oh, the Oracle Zelda games. games would have cool. to be the Oracle titles. Nintendo's Ages weird attempt seasons. at a Pokemon Red and Blue business model. In their defense, Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons are completely different games with unique overworlds, dungeons, and boss fights. Well, Oracle of Ages is more unique with its premise and monsters. Seasons is, in some ways, a reimagined Zelda 1 with a lot of returning bosses, including Aquamentus, Manhandla, and... Whoa, you... No! Not you! Here we have Dig Dogger, the giant sea urchin. Its Zelda 1 iteration actually made my worst Zelda bosses list a while back, but what, wouldn't you easy? know it, Seasons actually made this guy pretty fun. It's all thanks to a little tool you find in its dungeon, the ba -ba 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 Magnetic Gloves. <laughs> One of my favorite underused Zelda items. You press yeah. the button, and any metal object comes <laughs> flying towards you. You press it again, and they're repulsed <laughs> away. You can even cross chasms by pulling yourself towards metallic <laughs> objects. Why aren't these in more Zelda games? The possibilities <laughs> are limitless. Well, I mean, I guess it did come back once in Four Swords, and I guess Magnesis could be considered the same thing. Twilight yeah, Princess they say, even lets you use wrong. the iron boots to walk on magnetic surfaces but the magnetic gloves make this power so snappy and immediate and play into Dig Dogger's boss fight thanks to this conspicuously placed iron spiked ball. 
the slimy Cyclops tries to get close to me, boom. Bonk. He tries to hide in the corner, bam. And like his original incarnation, when he splits into smaller dick doggers. One, two. Bada bop, boom, pow. Oh! <laughs> That's what you get for that stupid flute puzzle, you bottom feeding freak. <sighs> it's the simple things fair. in life. It is admittedly kind As of janky, say, fair. and it's easy to ram the spike ball into yourself if you're overzealous. But it's also just so much fun to go nuts but with your telekinetic But it does seem like it gives you a ball. chance to actually hit him. It made this boss, just dare I say, down. exciting. Oh man, wait till I tell my friends in the Shire that I killed a sea. Oh, hey, Josh, hey, Ari. Poor guy. Um, boo. <laughs> Number 15, coming up. Oh, grab the heart. Oracle of Seasons takes us back to arcade Zelda action, but <laughs> Oracle of Ages is the thinking man Zelda, with more emphasis on puzzles Indeed, and puzzle uh? bosses. <laughs> it's perfect for more modern players who want to get the thing and use that thing on this thing. But for Ages it's really strategy and style. Dungeon, it's going to make you use all, all the things. It. This is Ramrock, who's not exactly winning awards for originality. Nintendo loves its floating head and hands fights, though Ramrock was the first in a Zelda game at least. Godan and Mazal actually stole his look, and he's got hands to spare throughout his four-phase altercation. In phase one, he takes a straightforward approach with rocket punches, bonk, bonk. but little does he know that Link has a stronger return serve than Serena Williams. Yeah. Boom. With That's punching one. out of the question, Ramrock so changes tactics two. and attempts to crush you to death. Here, my so what do you do when your enemy extends a hand? You give him a bomb. Bye -bye. Okay, okay, says Ramrock. This time I'll use shield hands, turtle up, and spit fireballs that Link can't deflect. This one's a bit tricky, but with Link's anti shooter, you can ricochet your shots off the back wall and into his unsuspecting <laughs> oh, nope. stony skull. Bonk. Finally, <laughs> Ramrock's silicon processor resolves to crush you with big oh, iron flails, perfect for the magnetic gloves. Wait, no, wrong version. No, wrong, yeah, perfect for the power glove. There you go. So bad. You can pick those metal wrong orbs right glove, up though. and snap him back into his face for the final blow. It's a long <sighs> fight, taking 13 hits in total to finish him off. Arguably too long for what isn't the most really four for each. Stage. Think about it. Like the visual that. language of this fight isn't all that great. Like you might lose some hearts to trial and error because it's not necessarily obvious that you're supposed to grab these flails, for instance. But True. it's rare to see a boss incorporate so many different tools in Link's arsenal. Dig Dogger and Ramrock each exemplify <sighs> the best qualities of their respective games. One's a slow and methodical game of wits and adaptive problem solving. The other is pow. Whack. <laughs> the Oracle games are a weird experiment, Boop. but when they're fun, they're, they're fun. fun. Again, depends on your taste. 14, coming in. You want to know one character that I really miss? Vati. Oh. And not just like I miss seeing Man, him a lot in the today. I miss seeing him in the fandom. We don't really talk about him anymore. After being the main villain for Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures, and the Minish Cap, so trilogy. Zelda fans back in the early aughts were really rooting for this mad Minish magician to show up in a big 3D game, or Smash Brothers, or maybe even Hyrule Warriors, or something. He was the most prominent villain since Ganondorf, but sadly, the Vati train has left the station, and I don't <sighs> think it's coming back. Well, at least I can honor him here. I said I wouldn't be listing any final bosses on this list, but Vati's fan club knows there's one time he wasn't the final boss. The Four original hijacked by Ganon. Well, okay, technically Aganon was the first hijacked by Ganon, yeah. but this is where we first started using that phrase. True. Four Swords Adventure isn't structured like most Zelda games. It's broken into segmented levels, and each of those levels have bosses. A lot of bosses. Some of them are certainly as fun as Vati. On the original list, I had Jump Scare Jalahala in this spot, but is... none of them pack the same Yeah, I was about to punch. say Ghost Kirby there. Granted, there's not a lot of story here, just the usual banter and then the bell rings. But as a scholar of the great Zelda continuity, this is the last chronological hurrah for uh -oh. this Tempest Sorcerer. And he comes dressed to the nines oh, in his giant eyeball form. Would have loved to see his humanoid form, but to be fair, that wasn't actually invented yet until Minish Cap. Mm. Vati floats atop his particle effect tornado, which Zelda fans know means Final. you throw bombs. On the worst boss list, I berated mm. Cyclops for this same mechanic, <laughs> but here it's a lot easier to aim your bombs and know that they'll be going up to the boss. The only trick is timing it to explode at the apex. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be thrown back at you, which is okay. kind of hilarious. Eventually, Vati learns from his mistakes and stops his tornado, instead just floating there, menacingly, and occasionally firing rings of projectiles. That's where the holes in the floor come in. Anytime you fall down a hole in this game, you're displayed on this little side-scrolling window. And if you're playing yeah. co-op, this will be your GBA screen. It's yeah, you need both a GameCube and a GBA for this you game. You can easily get back up by Ooh. using this cannon. 
But in what? the second phase, oh, you nope, need to missed. figure out how to use this cannon offensively by launching yourself above uh -huh. Bati and then hit yeah. him with the old down thrust. There you go. Again, mildly entertaining when you're playing alone, <laughs> but incredibly frantic when four links are scrambling to do it all at once. Bati will even try to hide at the bottom screen to get away from the reigning links, prompting you to play ladder defense and slash up his corneas. Honestly, you're kind of bullying him at this point. Man. That's ultimately why Vati ranks so low, despite being a cathartic also, end to a major Also, apparently you can stun with like a two good phases weren't enough for this guy. Possible shot. This fight needs just a little something more to push it to be an all-time great boss fight. Something to really demonstrate Vati's power and show why the Wind Mage was a threat great enough to come back for multiple games. Instead, he's a bit of a pushover. I almost feel bad for him. But then again, this is Vati. The guy who turned Ezlo into a hat, turned Zelda into stone, got sealed in a sword, broke out and captured Zelda, got again. resealed, broke out again, and recaptured Zelda. He again. had it coming. I bet you, you would have done the same. Bet you wish you didn't <laughs> split Link into four clones now, you dumb Oculus. Four Swords Adventure was made Goodbye. as a co-op game that you could also play by yourself, and whether you're one player or four, Vati throws a great going away party. You just need to provide the fireworks. Yep, and Vati's the fireworks. Ah, boom. All right, 13, come up. Here's a big one. Good. Ocarina of Time. And yes, our first 3D it's game. It's for my favorite game of all time, and it set the standard for 3D Zelda, Nate, for 3D adventure games. Sounds but I right. wouldn't call its bosses a highlight. At yeah, best, it's the first 3D adventure, what do you standard, expect? Popularizing the pattern of a boss fight being the yep. final test in a dungeon. Not a test of your skills, per se, but a chance to test run your newest item. You wait for the boss to do their one thing, and then you do your one Whoop. thing, and then the boss falls over, and you get to hit it with your sword for a few seconds. Yeah. Serviceable at best, frustrating at worst. What elevates okay, one so are we going? fight over the others, however, is the context. I got close to picking Bongo oh. Bongo for the sheer DK Bongo peripheral nightmare fuel of it all, <laughs> but ultimately I have to defer oh, to my hey. the original video, the battle where you kill Ganondorf's moms. Kum and Kotake, collectively known as Twin Rova, are the twin hags of the Gerudo tribe, controlling fire and ice magic respectively. Hmm. From the start, these two have more personality than most of the Ocarina boss roster. You get a glimpse of them abducting Naburu a couple of hours earlier, and they uh -oh. even get dialogue before their boss fight where they play pretend witches with each other like typical sisters. Except in this case, it's not pretend at all. No, Plus, they actually are. unique theme song. The melody has this flighty call and response to it that goes perfectly with their back and forth retorts. The battle consists of two distinct phases, both of which use your most recently acquired item, the Mirror Shield. You've already used this thing for plenty of puzzles throughout the Spirit Temple, but rarely do you get to use this burnished bulwark so offensively. First, the witches will blast their individual elements at you. Reflect the fire projectiles at the Ice Witch and the mm -hmm. Ice Projectiles at the Fire Witch, easy peasy. Then the sisters fusion dance into their giant, true twin Rova form with powers over both radical temperatures. Rather than reflecting immediately, the mirror shield absorbs these projectiles until it gets three of the same type in a row, at which point you can inflict Aegis Annihilation and blast Final. the witch kaiju out of the sky. <laughs> Do this a few times, watch their ghosts pass on, wonder why two crones that committed several war crimes seem to be going to heaven, and collect the final dragon you need to go beat up their son. Twin yeah. Rova is a solid boss, capping off a solid uh -huh. dungeon, aided by a brief bit of personality, but what oh, makes her oh. my favorite in Ocarina of Time is how weirdly significant this boss is to the greater lore. I'll be the first to admit that Zelda lore doesn't matter that much compared to the gameplay, but I've been playing this Fair. series for 30 years, fighting this same Gerudo warlock, <laughs> and this is the battle where you get to kill the ladies who raised him. These witches are likely the ones who taught Ganondorf to wield such powerful magic, Ganondorf at least claims, sometimes, that he conquered Hyrule to help his people, but perhaps it was his adoptive mother who pushed him to such violent ways of doing so. They've appeared multiple times throughout the series, as often as Vati even, just huh. not always as villains. In Majora's yeah, Mask, they have more mellow day jobs, and in the Oracle games, they show up for the secret ending, boss fight and all, reviving their son as their final act. That's all three timelines accounted for. Being such important Bobby. characters maybe doesn't make the fight any more interesting in the game itself, but it's that kind of thing that Ooh, I find myself thinking about while I'm Z-targeting these cantankerous cronies. <laughs> mirror, mirror, as my defense, carry me through this boss fight so tense. Get it. Pretty much. Bye, girls. Enjoy wherever you're going. Ocarina of Time popularized the use item approach to all bosses that gave a sense of order and clarity to future titles like Ooh. Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. Before that, though, oh, Majora's Mask woke up and chose Chaos. 
With the second smallest boss roster in the series, the four <sighs> masked beasts were boss. surprisingly open-ended, hit their weak point by any means necessary. There were tricks to each one, sure, like using bombs to distract Odala's moths, or drinking heavily to numb the pain of Gjorg. Yeesh. But there was room to be creative. Nowhere is that more apparent than Got, a mechanical bull who would be right at home as a Tears of the Kingdom build. And Ooh. yes, the wiki says it's pronounced Got, as much fun as got. it would be okay. if it were the goat. The strategy here isn't yeah, complicated, it's but it's silent. freaking <laughs> awesome. Put on your Goron mask, roll around at the speed of sound, and bash into him with your spiky <laughs> bot until the cows come home. Whee. Even in Zelda games with actual trains and cars, there's no boss fight with quite this kind of need for speed intensity. Run, and run. like the other Majora's Mask bosses, you'll either need to be really good at dodging or have a lot of hearts from side questing. Collect magic bottles to keep your Goron powers up while avoiding flying rocks, falling mm -hmm. stalactites, and bombs from his bovine behind. Or, if you want to be a little weirdo, find a safe place to camp and shoot arrows at Got as he gallops by. It's not the most fun strategy, but mm -hmm. I appreciate there being multiple ways to victory here. This is all in the original version of Majora's Mask, mind you. The 3DS remake took some... Liberties? Liberties with go. the bosses. But I'd say Got's the one that survived this transition the best. It does require you to play Goron Gladiator now, so no campy shooty strats. And it adds these phases of vulnerability where a big glowy eye appears Ooh. that you gotta hit with your sword or arrows. It's more like the other 3D Zelda games if you're into that, but I prefer the original personally. I could have yeah, ranked fair. Got higher, but if I use the 3DS version of Bjork for the worst bosses, Oof. then 3DS Got needs to at least be averaged into original Got score. I could forgive the loss of the arrow strat, but I hate how it breaks up the momentum of the fight and makes you stop in your tracks. That's objectively less fun. But it's still Goron Excite Bike and still the best fight <laughs> in the game. That's my opinion at least, though I might be a tad biased. Back in the day, this is the boss I'd rematch the most often, since you'll need That's him dead on each cycle to do the Goron races and get the Gilded Sword. Hmm. For a boss that you might have to fight three or four times in your quest for 100%, God's consistently fun to mow down. And now I just realized the real problem the with the imprisoned and Skyward Sword. They just needed to make him a metal cow and everything would be fine. Yeah, it could have been worse. So I finally forgot. <laughs> Where that? Number 11, next. Was I drunk of Chateau Romani when I ordered this list? Because somehow, oh, I Triforce. put the boss from yes. Triforce Heroes above both N64 entries. I guess I'm just me, a little more critical of my two favorite Zelda games. Bosses weren't their strongest <laughs> suit, and hot take? You all missed out on not playing Triforce Heroes when it was new. With its hop-in, hop-out level design, it might actually beat out Four Swords Adventures as the best co-op Zelda. Of course, all the bosses have the same problem that the entire game does. If your partners are uncooperative or, dare I say, inept, Dirt. kiss your shared health bar goodbye. But when you have a good team going, and you're somehow in sync with only these funny Link emotes, these bosses are amazing. So which one is the most fun, with the least potential for stupidity-fueled party wipes? Balancing the scales, oh. I'm gonna go with Blazagia. First Blazagia. of all, I love how original Blizzard this is for a Zelda boss. Nakia? I mean, it's not wholly original, Blazagia is basically a playoff of Volvagia, oh. the serpentine dragon that first appeared in Ocarina of Time. Cool. Well, technically in Zelda 2, they translated the name right. And his stony mask is a play on the Helmosaur King, a boss from A Link to the Past that I ranked in the old list. It's also just nice to have a snake boss in Zelda yeah. that isn't some form of antlion or just a worm made out of balls. This cold-blooded killer Ooh, comes in two phases. Phase 1, it'll pop out of these tunnels, targeting one of the links with a bite attack. Its eyes even flash for a split second with the corresponding color, so hopefully you can figure out who the target is before then, and the chosen link can lead Blazashia away from the rest. Good coordination will give the other links an opening to smash his helmet with the magic hammer. Moving into phase two, the stone cold copperhead will freeze the Ooh. floor and spend the rest of the battle out in the open chasing you down. The goal here is to break the mask, but even when you're not in position, you can still break these ice crystals on its back for hearts or melt them away with the fire gloves. Yeah, you thought the magnetic gloves were obscure? Link stole the fire flower for a game. <laughs> you can even temporarily melt a spike on Blazagia's tail, taking away its biggest damage dealer for a few seconds. And if you hammer the non-crystal parts of its body, it slows Blazagia down with a satisfying squishy effect. <laughs> you gotta admit, that's pretty funny. Once you break the mask, yep, you can finish this. the job with your bonk, sword, bonk. but he'll get even more erratic with his sidewinding Oh, movements. look at the tail. It's hectic, not helped by the ice physics, but it's a fight where all the links can contribute at all times, whether they're hitting the weak point, slowing it down, or farming for health. You don't even have to lift each other to kill this thing. Sure, the totem stack can help when he raises his head, but it's not necessary preventing the number one cause of bad teamwork in this game. I'm grading this boss both for its potential Ooh. fun and its potential headache, which is Sorry. a pretty wide range. 
I guess that lack of the consistency is what landed Blazagia on the lower half of this list, but if Nintendo ever makes this game reasonably Almost available again, I highly recommend you get some friends and kick some ass. True. Hopefully you got a good connection. Halfway. Now for the top half. First up, 10. A Link to the Past can be tough Ooh. if you're not used to it. Being a few years too late, I didn't get into this SNES Classic until it was re-released for the GBA, and even then, it was one of the more vanilla Zeldas in my mind. But then I dove yeah, back into 16-bit Hyrule while researching this list, and something about its simple yet robust controls really spoke to me this time around. Oh. Bosses don't have the same theatricality as in later games. You're just confronted by these crazy designs and have to deal with it before it consumes your health bar. Shout out to my previous pick, the Helmosaur King. But for that express what the fuck feeling, I want to talk about Trinix. Oh, I mean, what even sure. is that thing? I had to yes. fight this thing? Triple headed. More on this is kind of neat, actually. Trinix. Oh, I just got it. Trinix. Oh. Trinix. Ah. It has three necks. Trinix <laughs> is the boss of Turtle Rock, which Ooh, was carved into the shape of a guardian hell, tortoise by the inhabitants of the sacred realm before it was turned into the dark world. That's pretty cool. Too bad you need to quake its head apart to get inside. Whoops. Sorry. Well, anyway, I guess King Ghidorah Tortoise here is the temple's guardian corrupted by the Dark World, sporting an impregnable shell and three heads, two of which spit fire and ice. There's a lot that can hit you in this first phase of the fight, reminiscent of the Gliok fight, but this time you have your own you. corresponding fire and ice rods, so you can kill the auxiliary heads with their opposing element. Then the shell explodes, and the last head is... a snake. And this one is made of balls. So the Guardian hmm. Tortoise wasn't turned evil. It was killed and inhabited by a trio of evil serpents. Yikes. Gross. Actually, now that I think about it, the way we got into this dungeon foreshadowed how the boss fight goes down. You slash the body segments while the last neck zooms around at right angles like an old cell phone game. And then you're rewarded by freeing... Princess Zelda. Huh. Yeah, you actually rescued the princess a little early in this adventure. Huh. There's certainly potential for That's frustration new. here. In particular, the first phase is very reliant on your magic meter. If you have bad aim with the fire and ice rods and haven't packed potions, the fight can become unwinnable. My counter, however, is that A Link to the Past is a pretty snappy game, designed around bosses that you might not get the first or second try. It's pretty easy to refill your resources and get back into the boss room for another attempt. And aside from an homage in A Link Between Worlds, Trinix has never come back, keeping this encounter special. <laughs> He may be tough, and his name may sound like an antidepressant, but this Actually snake and turtle's clothing right deserves too. to be remembered. Hmm. Consult your doctor before encountering Trinix. Some restrictions may apply. And side effects include death. Sorry. <laughs> Had to go there. Number nine. Going up. Here we reach another set of games that I think Ooh. are undervalued. The Quest. DS titles. Temple of the Ocean King aside, these games are fantastic. Y'all are just me. And, Fair. as I found in my worst bosses list, their boss fights are pretty reliable, with higher highs in the N64 games with not nearly as bad <laughs> lows. I could hardly pick one what for Phantom say, Hourglass. Worse. I was stuck between Craig for the funny crab vision gimmick, and the diabolical Cuba sisters for being little imps that I just could not wait to kill. Ultimately though, I went with Eox, <laughs> the ancient stone soldier. Ooh, with fun. a title like that, I have expected him to attack the moon. These hey, games have strength for levels and bosses that take advantage of the DS hardware. Oh, and by din, I do not know if they could ever port this game with the same sense of scale. I love the way E I wonder, towers into okay, the second Okay, I was about screen. to say, could do like the with the agile one creature. half on that screen, half on the main screen? I don't know. Fighter. So you'll need but to watch his telegraphs bad. on the top screen to avoid his fists and arrows on the bottom screen. Eventually, you can access Whee. these catapults where you can launch yourself with your most recent dungeon item, the hammer. I never time. did figure out exactly how this item works in universe. Like, is Link telekinetically controlling a magic hammer, or does he just pull a crap ton of them from You know where? Hammer space. Ah. Okay, I walked right in. <laughs> well it hardly matters when you're flung up into the air and sending your mail like from Davis down this clunky colossus, cracking him Bridge. down to his wooden <laughs> scaffolding to reveal the pegs that you need to topple him. This is just satisfying to me on a primal level. Whee! Go forth, my galleon's gavels. Rain down and deliver holy touchscreen judgment. Whee! But Eox doesn't quit when <laughs> he's ahead. In fact, Bam. his head is its own siege weapon. Somewhere between a huacha and a covered battering ram. Use the catapult uh, again to land on top and form a reverse around. battle of Troy Whee! where you can hit this crystal with your sword for the kill. Boing. Or keep using your hammer because that's just been so much fun thus far. <laughs> this boss isn't complicated. Heck, the solution to phase two is really the same as phase fun. one. Literally launch Link aloft liberally. But what can yep, I say? Just it keep works Link airborne, you'll be it fine. It doesn't annoy me at any point, and it gives just me that look small for the brush of adrenaline text. every time I fling myself into the air. Pretty great for a DS boss, but I think we can do better. 
Eh, to be fair, it does use like the whole. <laughs> I don't know, just seeing Link go airborne, it's definitely a sight to see, you know? <laughs> the little has been clip, I gotta like that, you know? <laughs> Alright, so. Eight more to go. Let's keep going. Number eight. Let's see who's next. Spirit Tracks improves on Phantom Hourglass in pretty much every category, aside from lineback content. I gotta have more lineback, line man. Hmm. Once again, the boss roster gives us a few choices. Burn was so close. <laughs> I feel like if he had one more phase or just went a little crazier, he'd be an all-time great villain fight. Kragma is say, pretty much worse. the Eox of Spirit Tracks, and I actually picked him last time. And then there's uh, Skeldritch, oh, ah. a boss so cool that I actually misremembered and thought I picked them last time. Well, I'd hate well, to be a liar, so... Here Fun you go. fact, in the PAL version, this boss is called Capbone, Cap which is an infinitely worse name than Skeldritch. Seriously, how do you guys keep getting the worst translations? You got Skeldritch me. towers above you in I a stadium Europe. arena, firing boulders from his spine-mounted ah. cannons. And for a post-Ocarina boss fight that depends on a single item, it helps for that item to be as uniquely awesome as a sand wall, which allows you to earthbend any sand into protective pillars and cushion the advance of these projectiles. Then you can make like a dung beetle and roll that Hello. sucker into a catapult to return <laughs> to sender, smashing Skeldritch apart vertebra by vertebra. As you near his bony jawline, some but of these vertebra will like, be armored, yeah. meaning you'll need to be a little Boop. clever on how you launch your boulders. This was fun to work out, getting the boulder in place and running to the other side of the boss to trigger the mechanism with a well-aimed arrow, all while dodging the occasional fuck you laser. The yeah, final much. What is what is the and lasers? Eox. Reduced only to a head, Skeldritch will chase you down like Pac-Man, but can easily be stopped with more sand, and then you can sand lift yourself to reach his gem oh, for the coup de gras. What I love about this fight is the openness. <laughs> There's a very specific solution, but rather than interacting like with one switch, one grapple all. point, one catapult, etc., your main point of interaction is the entire floor. You gotta stop Whoa. and load the rocks, but how exactly you do that is your own little project. The arena oh, no, is your do. canvas, okay. and your paint is sand. It may be coarse and irritating, but it gets everywhere. In a series full of notable skelly say, boys like Stalwart and Stallblind, Skeldritch manages to stand out. And he's just a spine and a head. Imagine if he had arms. Yeah, luckily he didn't. Otherwise, we'd be screwed. <laughs> Seven, coming up. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds Ooh. wears its inspiration on its sleeve, and most of its bosses are a reprise of A Link to the Past with some kind of twist. Ooh. That includes a molten version of Trinix named Grinix, but okay. instead, I'm going Whoa. to avenge the Helmosaur King, who's been sleeping under tons of sand for 20 years, and he's now looking fabulous! fabulous. Granted, the original was larger and more imposing compared to Link, but now that he has a 3D model, Gemosaur can actually <laughs> turn his body. He'll charge at you yep. immediately, stopping only to breathe a crystalline spread shot here and there. I oh, really geez, love this level out. of aggression. Sometimes the feral lizard just won't give you time to retaliate, so you have to make time yourself by using your bracelet to blue skidoo into the wall and find yourself some breathing room. Once he's off your coattails, you can mount your counterattack. Bombs are your best friend here for cracking the crystal skull, and if you break the jewels on his body, they'll shatter into Ooh, rupees. Thank you. That's actually a nice touch. Once eh. you remove the helmet, Gemisaur has another defense Ooh. mechanism. He's able to cloak himself oh, in impenetrable darkness. Illuminate the room with your lantern or fire rod, and he'll be good and vulnerable again. Gemisaur King is a remix of the classic fight that's more maneuverable and more threatening. Breaks the fight into multiple Yikes. phases using multiple items, and utilizes the unique mechanic of A Link Between Worlds for a really fun twist. He checks all the boxes and goes ever so slightly beyond with attention to detail. And my favorite thing about oh, Gemisaur... Creepy and A Link Between Worlds bosses in general, is a slight return to form for Zelda bosses. Oh. By the DS title, Zelda has really settled into that overly structured, use the dungeon item on the boss design. Eox and Skeldridge are my favorites for being the least guilty of that sometimes static philosophy. Gemisaur's mad running takes me back to, well, well A Link to the classic. Past, and older games in general where the fight was a little more arcadey and a little less like the monsters were just waiting for you to use their weakness. The trade-off? Maybe Gemisaur King's lighter on that kind of curated spectacle games can have when the bosses are secretly not that dangerous. But I think this diamond in the rough still proves how much this game can shine. No oh, kidding. I love the gem on it though. Gotta love that. <laughs> Number six, coming in. And now for the hey, reason why it took so long to remake this list. Tears of the Kingdom. 
I waited years for this awaited 20th game in the franchise, hoping it would have a better boss selection than its predecessor. And it does. On the merit oh. that it actually has multiple okay. bosses and not just the Get same them. one in four flavors. And most there, of them are pretty worse. darn good. If anyone's wondering, Muktarok would have been on my worst bosses list if Tears of the Kingdom was out at the time. <laughs> but for the best... Well, Whee! there's a few schools of thought here. Especially when you consider Bradia. the field Ooh, bosses. Bad. Gliok almost got on the list oh, a second geez. time, That's particularly a... his Trilemental Super Boss huh. version. But the boss that made the greatest impression was Kolgera. Whoa. Don't get me wrong, Kolgera is, is easy, stupidly easy in fact. But in its defense, I think Nintendo intended for this to be your <laughs> first boss in this game. Most bosses can be your first boss in the open world of Tears of the Kingdom, but the early game kind of pushes the player towards Whee. Rito Village. Pearl will point you to the first Dragon Tier, which will then point you to the Hyrule Gazette, and by then, you're right outside of Bird Town. And it makes sense, so because like, the ability not? you get from Tulin in this quest is the most useful to pick up first. <laughs> Kolgera is a warm-up boss, a very cold <laughs> warm-up boss. And mechanically, it's very different from its peers. All of the other main bosses plant Link's feet on the ground, testing you on your classic Z targeting combat. Oh, but Kolgera is the only boss to revolve around the game's main traversal mechanic, oh, gliding. gliding. If you're good enough, you won't even have to touch the ground at all. Whee. The updrafts constantly refill your stamina yeah. and push you skyward, and if you've never played Breath of the Wild before this and haven't mastered the slow motion aerial archery, this is a great way to learn. It's borderline huh. unlosable, but far from brain dead. You're in the yeah, pilot seat the whole time aiming your shots. It's just so much fun having this much control in a stratospheric ballet. And about that spectacle. Nintendo casually gave this boss the best theme in the game. A play on the Mulgara theme from Wind Waker that everyone loves so much, highlighted with the leap motif of Dragon Roost Island soaring above the chorus. Holy shit, that's good! Even if I can shatter this boss before it even plays. Whether it's from a need for nice. more of this song, or the exhilaration of falling with style, Players started creating their own little fun challenges with this particular oh. boss. What, you got? what if I told you that Kolgera can be killed without even firing your bow? Oh, Just this gain is a guy some height and dive, Yee dive, dive through his weak point like a pointy-eared torpedo. I think Control <laughs> Freak said it best. He used himself as an arrow. Unbelievable! Just because a boss well, you is learn, buddy. doesn't Get good. mean it's boring. <laughs> but not often does such a boss is using yourself as an arrow. highlight just... of the game. Yeehaw! Heck, a highlight of the series. I mean, imagine you had the sword just like, Yahoo! Jump through. <laughs> Love it. All right, number five coming up. I bet you thought we were done with oh. 2D Zelda, huh? Oh. Hello, nope. Hello, Minish Cap. Minish Cap. And look, it's another sky battle. <laughs> this time against the... York Pear? York uh, is pretty much the worst boss in the series. You're telling me I gotta fight two of these things? Yes. Uh, different Don't York. worry. These multiple manta-like monsters are a yeah, lot better than say. that foppish fiendish flounder. You spend the entire fight hopping between these two sky pancakes. And it turns out that female Georgs are naturally larger than the males. A true fact <laughs> of real world mantas. Whee. The more you know. And I'm realizing that a lot of my favorite Zelda bosses are the ones that make you jump. In this case, you have the rock's cape to hop over the Daddy Georg's tail when it starts spinning Whoa. said tail like a skippet with less risk <laughs> of self-injury. But your main goal is to take out Mommy Georg's eyes. Oh, oh, hey, I'm not just it. being cute with these Mommy and Daddy names either. They have kids, which they use as ammo ah, against you. Watch it. To damage the eyes, you'll need to hit them all simultaneously. Throughout the Minish Cap, hmm. you've been powering up the Bakori Blade into what will eventually become the Four Sword. But for now, it's just the Three Sword. Using these panels that you've seen elsewhere in the game, you'll have to duplicate Link in the One, right formation two, to strike those fish eyes. And aside yeah. from the final showdown with Vati, this is the only time in the game where this mechanic is used offensively like this. It's a bit of a challenge too, because <laughs> Daddy Manta will come in doing aileron rolls and spitting fire. And to address a logical criticism of this fight, why don't they just roll over while you're on their back and just drop you out of the sky, like the oh. sandbird in my Mario Sunshine War flashbacks? I'll Simple. give them ideas. Because the Georgs are carnivores. Their figurine clearly states that they feed off of adventurers. Oh. They don't want to splatter you across Hyrule. They want to eat Bear you for lunch. breakfast. But for real, why this over the last Sky Boss that I just talked about? <laughs> well, while I don't mind Kolgera being an easy icebreaker, it is Literally. nice to have a challenge. Let me actually bring up a third Sky Boss. So you know Argorok from Twilight Princess? Yeah. 
I love that fight for its spectacle, but it's also <laughs> ass easy for the opposite reason as Colgera. Really? With Colgera, the updrafts let you move around wherever you want, and the Frostworm hardly attacks. With Argorok, the dragon's constantly attacking you, and you're confined to these contrived grapple points. But that just means that there's no decision making. Just clash out to the next point, and you'll eventually outpace his fire breath. The Georg pair Seems easy enough. threads that needle with a limited Ooh. movement space, but enough wiggle room to make you think through avoiding these aggressive enemies. It may not be as graphically robust, but I'm finally Again, feeling GBA the peril in this situation. That backdrop is just a blue damage zone, but the game has sold the illusion that I'm miles from terra firma. I don't think I'm off base saying that this is the best 2D Zelda boss, and a rags to riches story for Georgs everywhere. I'm kind of curious to see what happens if it, like, it didn't jump onto the mail. Next. At number four, we have another Ooh, flying Waker. boss, but this one's fought much closer to sea level. And that's good for this particular uh, incarnation of Link, who hasn't had a lot of luck with heights. Oof. Ow. The Helmorok King is a recurring figure in Wind Waker. And it just occurred to me that this is Zelda's continuation of the Helmosaur King, just more avian. They even Pretty much, the, the Burton Helmosaur King. You know, we have a lot of races that undergo macro evolutions in the centuries between Ocarina and Wind Waker, and the birds are the closest living descendants of dinosaurs. So this makes a lot of sense. Anyway, yeah, true. the Feathered Fiend is pretty much the main villain for the first half of the game, the Darth Vader to Ganondorf's Palpatine. He kidnapped mm -hmm. your sister to start this adventure, and after a tedious rescue attempt, threw Link out to sea. Uh... This Dodo's demise is a long time coming. Ooh. Luckily, your second visit to the Forsaken Fortress here, is much more of a power trip <laughs> thanks to the Master Sword. And when Helmorok sneaks into that prison uh -oh. tower, you're ready for him this time. Before the fight itself, you get this action chase sequence, something you don't see Excuse often me? in Zelda, where the prison tower is flooded and you need to race up the spiral staircase, avoiding the hovering Helmorok and sidestepping enemies to avoid the rising waves. This gives the fight a unique sense okay, of scale, say, I don't see the waves. moving through the fortress a bit. Finally, you're at the top of the battlements, backdrop with the ever-recognizable spotlight that gave you so much trouble in the early game, and the true showdown can begin. This final battle with the, the turkey King rides high on catharsis. After everything you've been through, you get to pound this poultry in the most satisfying way imaginable. Avatar. A giant-ass <laughs> sledgehammer. Just gotta dodge a few talent sweeps, wait for him to get his beak stuck, and then hit him in the face! In the Come face. on, bonk! <laughs> Come on, coach! I was aiming for a home run, but I keep hitting fouls. Bonk! <laughs> and once the Iron Mask is destroyed, this Yay. formerly infallible foe is stripped down to the glorified <laughs> chicken that he is. Get I've said before that Wind Waker is one of the most consistent when it comes to its bosses. There's really not a bad one in the bunch. So, what makes the Helmorok King stand out from this magnificent menagerie? It's certainly not a complicated fight. One could even call it too simple if you don't count the chase sequence before it. But for me. It's really the context of the fight that adds to the grandeur. I mentioned before how Vati and Twin Rova are both big events when you think about the greater lore of the series. The Helmorok King actually feels like a big event when you're actually fighting it. And I mean, considering the story up to that point, shift on its it does. Here. This particular Link set out to save his sister, and after you beat this bird, you did it. You overcame this obstacle that you've had since the beginning and proved that you can be a hero. And after this point, the game becomes about proving that you're THE hero. One worthy to stand in the annals of history next to the hero of time. To nice. fully restore the Master Sword and settle the fate of Hyrule. <laughs> Helmorok King is the fulcrum. The monster under your bed that you have to conquer before you get to the adult problems. Yep. Weird to imply that everything up till now has been kid problems, but you get what I'm saying. And besides, Ganondorf's gonna whoop Link's ass after this fight, oh. so let him enjoy pile driving Big Bird while he can. Yeah, I would too. The real complaint about this fight is that it explodes after defeat. I bet those legs are delicious. Eh, you ain't wrong. I don't want to eat myself one. <laughs> Still. Woohoo! <laughs> I've mentioned before three, how disappointing go. the boss fights Ooh, in Breath of the Wild are, and yet here it is at number three. Yep. How did that happen? I was really thinking I'd default to Thunderblight Ganon for requiring the most actual thought, and dare I say, it's actually a pretty fun and exhilarating fight. But then came the Champion's Ballad DLC, which is admittedly an expensive content pack of more samey shrines and yet more fights with aspects of Ganon. But at the end of the long and winding road, you complete the final trial, approach the altar of a decrepit Sheikah Elder like you've done a hundred times before, and why do I hear boss music? Yep! That master's still alive! That 
That's right. Monk After Monk. all this time receiving instructions Maskoshia. from these emaciated mummies, Monk Maz Koshia decides to show us what one of these bags of bones is capable of in the field of battle. And it's maybe the closest thing Zelda's ever had to a true super boss. At least in its sense of scope. True, Considering could the be worse. Sheikah are the ones who built these temples, inventing the roving guardians and the Sheikah slate, hmm. it's no surprise he's packing a lot of attacks. Four stages worth, in fact. Koshia takes it easy on you in the first fourth of the battle, huh. imitating the attack patterns of the Yiga soldiers. That makes a lot of sense, actually. The Yiga are said to originally have defected from the Sheikah, so it's no surprise that they would have similar fighting styles. Only instead of a sickle, Koshia's got one of those ancient swords that you see the training the robots use. Nice touch. After hitting the 75% health threshold, Maz goes full Kagebushi no Jutsu, producing eight holographic clones. Now we know where Impa got that trick for Age of Calamity. Yep. The doppelgangers poof out in one hit, but they are capable of hurting Link. So a lot of and they aren't shy too. about launching attacks simultaneously with bows and meteor drops. This tends to be the trickiest phase for me, just because Koshia gets very slippery here. It helps to use Urbosa's <laughs> Fury as a quick area wipe, and if you've upgraded stasis, it can help you get a few extra hits in once you've identified the real Maz. Yep. For phase 3, Maz Ooh. decides bigger is better, growing yep. to monstrous proportions and relying on magic. One attack summons spiked metal balls, Holy similar to a out. move Master Koga used. Interesting thought, but according to the Yiga, Koga is the respected ruler because he's the only one who knows these ancient magic techniques, the same powers that were commodified into the Sheikah Slate, which he says were passed down from his ancestors. Does this suggest that Koga is a direct descendant of Koshia? His great 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 300 times great grandson? Yeah, or no. The best solution here is actually similar to the aforementioned Thunderblight Ganon fight. Use Magnesis and wait for Lightning to strike. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Koshia didn't pass down all of his moves, though, because I've never seen Koga shoot lasers oh, out of his face. Again, the Sheikah invented the Guardians, so now we see him using the same power they put into these Robo Spiders. Finally, for Phase 4, Koshia will yeah, take advantage faces. of his newfound size to stomp Jump. you while continuing to spawn Link Size clones. And once you power on through this last phase, you'll be rewarded with the most sacred of Sheikah artifacts, the Harley Davidson. Yeah, you get a no, bike. really, you get a motorcycle to ride around Hyrule. Woohoo! Win stupid fights, get stupid prizes. Yeah, this fight fun. couldn't be more over the top, but it totally paid off in my opinion. Well worth the time spent trudging through the DLC shrines. My only regret is that I faced this boss after completing everything else in the game, so I was already equipped with the best weapons, armor, and meals possible. You can't even get this far until you've completed all four Divine Beasts anyway, True. so it stands to reason that most players will have a healthy supply of hearts if they made it this far. If they maybe scaled up his health and damage a little more so that the challenge matches the spectacle, this would be the ultimate bragging right in this game. But as is, yeah, it's honestly, a great I think if they got the damage output from her, I think it would work. You better. thought Breath of the Wild had a bad final boss? Hold my noble pursuit. Yeah, you're gonna need help with this one. Good luck. And for number two. There was a time not Ooh, long Skyward ago Sword. when I called Skyward Sword my favorite Zelda game. And while I've since fallen back to Ocarina and Majora as my favorites, eh, it could be worse. I think this prequel deserves way more credit than it sometimes gets. For instance, I never had a problem with the Wii Motion Plus. Not to dismiss other people's technical uh, issues, but Switch I feel now? that if you follow the setup directions and learn to play the game the way it wants, it makes for an intuitive combat system that combines the tried and true Z targeting with a sense of urgent precision. It's no Red Steel 2, but it gets the job done. Skyward Sword came out just Could a bit worse. too late to be on my original list, and I always figured Kalakdos would be the boss to include. But thinking on it now, the best fight in Skyward Sword should be the one that best uses the mechanics central to that game, i.e. the precision sword combat. And that brings me to Gear to him. The boss so nice, you uh. fight him thrice. <laughs> First of all, I love this guy as a villain. Fati's great and all, but Gear him is a villain who really knows how to steal a scene. He's incredibly off-putting, toying with Link in cutscenes and letting him live only because he finds the Hylian amusing. I don't even mind that he's not the main villain. I mean, he is in a way, he's the guy we're dealing with throughout most of the game. True. He's just not the top dog. But his devotion demise. to Demise is such a big part of his character from the very beginning that it feels right for the plot to get hijacked from him. After oh, all, man. it's what he wanted all along. Girahim is a tool. Literally, he is Demise's sword. And realizing that he's mm -hmm. the same type of entity as Phi, only evil, it's an awesome twist ripe with theory crafting possibilities. Like, mm -hmm. does that mean Phi's a demon too, or does that make her more of an angel since she's the opposite of Girahim? 
She does Either resemble or. the great fairy queen from Wind Waker. Is Girahim just the Dark Master Sword? The Sword of Lightsbane? Is Demise a dark counterpart to Link? Or to Zelda? Who is actually Hylia? Does that mean that the three goddesses of creation made both good and evil? Be well, regardless, I'm glad Girahim's not the final boss because it means we can put his final encounter on the list, Demon Lord Girahim. Ooh. By this point, this snake tongue swordman is regretting letting us live for so long, which I find very flattering. We are a bunch of meddling kids, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Each fight with Girahim that we've had up to this point has left him nicked and scratched, revealing a jet black alloy under his skin, and for this final fight, he turns his entire body into this adamantine finish while he stalls for time. At the same time, mm -hmm. he's creating floating platforms high above the sealed grounds for us to fight on, and is secretly continuing his Zelda-sacrificing ritual. I'll give him this, he's a very good multitasker. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to hurt him with his damage yeah. reduction, but you can push him down to the next platform, and then drop onto him with a fatal strike. Yeehaw! Do this a few times, and he'll give up on the platforms and fight you at ground level, but now he's got a weak point in his chest that you can thrust into. Throughout the fight, he'll go from empty-handed, to using a thin oh. saber, and finally a huge claymore that you have to chisel away at to break it. Plus, he's got his diamond projectiles and his own variation oh. of the Skyward Strike. And in all three phases, you'll occasionally have to stop and consider your swinging angle to get around his defenses. Aside from maybe the final boss that follows it, it's the game's sword fighting at its absolute pinnacle. And all of it is in service of beating up the guy who's caused us such a massive headache. Backed by his own iconic theme song in one of the most recognizable locales in the game. I'll just say it. This is the best boss fight in the sealed grounds. Controversial, I know. Hi. The present. worst part is this douchebag kind of wins. You beat him in the fight, sure. But your duel bought him just enough time to finish his ritual completing his ultimate goal of summoning his Dark Master. Listen to him laugh as Demise returns him to his inanimate form. He's so happy. Dare I say, most successful villain in the series right here. I don't need my Zelda bosses to be so plot significant, but if the fight is already mechanically rich and just happens to pay off hours of adventuring, not only hyping up itself, but the final boss that is to follow, well, you've got yourself a winner there. A second place winner to be specific. Because yeah, there's still one more to go. That does it better. But for now, tongues out for this insidious incubus. <laughs> Rest in peace, you magnificent bastard sword. Yep. Bye, Gernum. And now, the number one Zelda boss. Who do you got? Comparing this countdown to the one I made 12 years ago, I stay fairly consistent in my opinions on who is <laughs> the best boss in each game. The order's changed around a bit, and my pick from five True. of the original 15 Add have a few changed, more. along with five new games being considered. Two things, however, have not changed. Twilight Princess, by and large, has the coolest boss roster. Nice. And the best of the best is Zant. Zant, huh? The Mad Usurper. Nice. Interesting, to say the least. <laughs> as much as we love Ganondorf, Zelda fans have always been receptive of new villains in the series. Like School True, it's a nice change of pace. Him after, Zant was an exciting prospect. A unique villain uh -huh. in a big console Zelda game who did more than just wait in the castle for the final encounter. Oh, Not only do we there. see flashbacks of Zant's hostile takeover of the Twilight Realm, this enigmatic enemy shows up in person to wreck your day after you just collected the last few's shadow, injuring and practically killing Midna and batting away a light spirit with a wave of his hand. He's so stoic and imposing. So some fans were disappointed when he turned out to be yet another pawn of Ganon, and quite a bit goofier than we originally perceived. Sheesh. I can understand a disappointment, but I think this is a perfect turn for this character. Zant is In a way, the yeah, that makes sense. King. It See? was not his right to rule the Twilight Realm, and he only was able to do so by using power bestowed upon him by the true king of evil. And that backstory is expressed perfectly in his boss fight. One with six freaking stages. Six? How many stages? stages? <sighs> Yikes. Good times. And these stages aren't just a change in attack patterns, oh no. In each phase, Yikes. Zant creates an illusion of one of the boss rooms oh, you've been up. to throughout your journey. I won't go over every stage in detail, but to summarize, there's a topiary yeah. chamber where we fought Diababa, the magnetic platform where we fought oh. Dangoro, the lake bed where we fought Morpheal, the totem playground where we fought Ook the Baboon, and the frozen bedroom wow. where we fought Blazetta. It's an odd, incomplete selection of bosses, and I would have expected to see the Arbiter's Grounds or the City in the Sky mixed in, but it serves as a compilation of past fights, forcing you to dig up old strategies and see how far you've come. 
I mean, when's the last time you used the Gale Boomerang? Also, each phase incorporates a corruption of that original boss fight's theme, and these are some of the best boss and mini boss themes in the game, so I love it for that alone. Let's be honest, Ook's theme is a bop. But as much as I love the changing locales and Come the here. use of a variety of weapons, what really makes this oh. fight is Zant's demeanor throughout the battle. There were hints that Ganondorf might be involved in the grander scheme of things, but right you before this fight that. was his true reveal as the Puppet Master. <laughs> Likewise, while Zant was seemingly composed behind his twisted iron helmet, there was that occasional weird gesture or muffled grunt to suggest that he wasn't as cool a cucumber as he let on. And not unlike the Helmorok King, this fight is a stripping down of Zant as an antagonist, and he fights like a guy with unearned power. All of these fantastical magics at his disposal, and he has no idea how to properly use them. The many shapes and settings of this fight are just proof that he's throwing half-baked strategies at you and hoping that something will stick. He shakes the metal platform like he's trying to bully you off of a swing set. He turns giant and tries to stomp you, only to start hopping around like an idiot when you hit his ankles and he becomes smaller than his original size. And in the ook phase, he's literally just monkeying around. If any of these attacks hit you, it's not a testament to how he wields that power, just a testament to the power itself, mm -hmm. to Ganondorf's power. And to top it yeah, all off, own. after witnessing his mental breakdown in boss fight form, mm. we arrive at the final phase of the fight in front of Hyrule Castle where, depleted of Ganon's magic and at the end of his rope, Zant finally fights us with his own might. And he's actually a pretty scary swordsman. Teleporting around the field, which seems to be a natural talent of the Twilight people, and performing inhuman feats of contortion Whoa. and acrobatics, Zant is the biggest threat when he stops masquerading as some brilliant warlock and fights like himself. His insane, no hyperactive, Chateau Romani milk-fueled oh. self. With this much passion and energy, I'm <laughs> sure Zant could have been an asset to the Twilight people, but he unfortunately wanted more. He was mm -hmm. too ambitious, grew his power far beyond his own means to control it, and yep. once he's finally defeated, Midna delivers him an execution that is both morbid and Oof. admittedly Brutal. silly. A fittingly comedic end to a fittingly tragic adversary. Not only is Zant a fascinating character, his boss fight is built up over the course of the game paying off hours of exploring Hyrule with its references to previous fights, giving us something familiar yet new with a sense of hectic mm -hmm. grandeur, and it still succeeds ha! in hyping up the final dungeon ha! to come. Because come if this is how powerful the puppet is, imagine the puppet just master. Think what a guy who truly understands these powers can do. I am the Green Scorpion, and thank you for joining me on this journey through the best Zelda bosses. Nice. There's a lot that can be done with a fight. Clever use of items, tests on a game's central mechanics, epic spectacle, and diegetic storytelling. True. Zant gives us a little bit of everything and leaves us wanting more, despite giving us more than any other boss in the series. Who knows, maybe I'll be making this list again in 10 more years. You never but know. I wouldn't be surprised if Zant was still at the top. Rest now, brave heroes. The evil is defeated. Grab that heart container, and I'll see you all next time. Later. <laughs> And honestly, I have to say that is a good way to end it with Zant as the, well, reigning king of, well, boss fast. Which, I gotta admit, comparing it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So, let me know what you guys think of these lists, or do you agree with the boss fights? Let me know. Till next time, see ya.